Now in its ninth year, this is GabNet, the great American broadcast network. Talk like you've never heard it before. Hey everybody, this is Alex, and this is the Ramble. We go until midnight tonight, hopefully, in that city down there, New York, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, Larry Bubbles Brown has been a friend of mine for how many years now, Larry? Since 1983, so that would be 41 years. Wow, wow, I've known you that long? Yeah, I did your first, uh, yeah. first time you had me on the radio was January of 83. Well, I think it's time for us to just not be friends anymore. How do you like that? <laughs> Take a break. <laughs> mm-hmm. That is, a, that is a frightening. That's like, uh, what, 40, uh, 41, 41 years, years, you know? And I, I knew my friend Shecky for at least 45. So, you know, I mean, it, it, when Shecky went, I, I, it devastated me because I knew him for so long. So stay along. I, I didn't even know him, and I was devastated. He sounded like such a great guy. You stay away. Stay around here, okay? Don't leave. Don't leave me. I'm trying. I, I'm trying so to where think. did you meet? where did you meet Shecky? I'm, I was a gift. <laughs> I had, there was a guy I knew. His name was Steve Weiner. Worked. Uh, he worked. Uh, where he worked? Well, he actually worked at the Letterman Show. Uh, he was the first year of the Letterman Show, and then he got fired. And um, I, I think, it, it, but Shecky wasn't working at the Letterman Show at that time. So I knew him before. Oh yes, he had turned out a film that I liked called King of the Z's, which was a parody on a documentary about a mythical movie studio that was the cheapest movie studio of all time. You know, like they did a film of Hamlet with ducks, you know, uh, <laughs> things like that. A very funny film. And that's what got them hired over at Letterman. But he had done that film, and I loved that film. And we became friends, Steve Weiner and I. Now, he had this friend named Rick Sheckman. And he, this is before Rick Sheckman was Shecky, okay? And he, um, he, 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 he was a good friend with, with Rick. And so as a birthday present for Rick, who was a fan of my show, my radio show, he decided to invite him to lunch and asked that I maybe make an appearance as a cheap thrill for Shecky. So that's what happened. I was a gift. I was the cheapest birthday gift ever given. And uh, 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 we started becoming friends at that point. And I became bigger friends with Shecky than I ever did with Steve, although Steve's still a friend of mine. Um, but uh, he, uh, it was really, it was something, really something. And that's how I met him. And, uh, and he turned out to be one of the longest employees of the Letterman history, right? Yeah, short of six months of, he started at The Late Show on NBC. Uh, he did that, I think, within six months of it starting. Uh, in fact, uh, Steve got him that job. Uh, he said, "We I got a great guy who could be a great film coordinator for this show. And uh, they hired him on, and he started getting them all these incredible clips. And they loved him and, and kept him. And he then, he never became anything beyond film coordinator. Although, technically, if they were to give him a title... Other than that, for realistically what he did, they would have listed him as one of the producers um, because he had gotten that influential in the whole process. But he always wanted to be kept listed on the credits as film coordinator. Huh. So uh, that was his that was his title for for all of the shows between six months into the late show. At the end, he was, I think, the third longest employee of uh, Worldwide Pants, you know, so. Wow. And did he interact with Letterman at all? Oh, yeah, 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 quite a few. Uh, I'm, I'm sure he, you know, Dave never went around and said, hi, Shecky, how you doing today? You know, yeah. that wasn't Letterman, <laughs> okay? 
But, I mean, he had an ongoing relationship with Shecky, with uh, Letterman because guess who named him Shecky? Uh, probably Le- Letterman. Letterman. That, he had, had fun names for everybody, and, you know, um, his for, uh, for, for um, uh, Rick was, uh, was uh, Shecky. So the guy I knew as Rick morphed into Shecky, courtesy of David Letterman. Mm. And and yeah. he, he made a lot of appearances on the show. I mean, he played Elvis on the show. He did all. Yeah, kinds I remember of that things. one. Yeah, but he, he did all kinds of things. You know, uh, it was it was because his delivery was almost a lack of uh, of any kind of charisma. Exactly. Yeah, it was That's kind hilarious. Of, <laughs> right, Dave. I'm happy to be here, Dave. Even when he did Elvis, he read it so badly that it was funny. You know, and and Dave loved that. He loved people who had a character within themselves. Um, Larry Bud Melman is an example. Um, Calvert DeForest. Do you know? Do you know who you know? Calvert DeForest played Larry Bud Melman. You remember Larry Bud Melman? Don't right. You? He was very, very odd and funny. Do you know who he was the nephew of? No Lee, Lee DeForest, the guy who invented the vacuum tube. That made oh. it possible for us to have amplified audio. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, but uh, well, that's uh, February. That's uh, so. This month is the forty-second anniversary of the Letterman Show. Really? He started in February of eighty-two. Is, you mean the Night Show? Yeah. Because there was a Day Show. You know, a year there earlier. There was a Day Show. It was really. Very funny, but it didn't last very long. It was a great that show. afternoon show. Yeah, I went and saw that show. I have tapes of that show, and it's very funny, you know, very funny. Uh, but it was just too, it was too hip, it was too hip for the audience, you know. He replaced three game shows. That's That's the kind of time slot they gave him. So when he went to late night, that was the perfect time to put Letterman on because that's where his audience was, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, students, people who didn't sleep at night, you know, whatever. That was his audience, uh, and um, he he got a rather large audience uh, catering to them because nobody had been catering to them before. That was Tom Snyder, and that was a good show. You know, in fact, I was on that show once, uh, and Snyder uh, Snyder was. A, Pretty good interviewer, I think. Not a great interviewer. Oh, I but, like him a lot. Yeah. Yeah, but the show wasn't wasn't too hip for the room. It was under hip for the room. Okay, so when Letterman came on, it was refreshing. A story that people never talk about, and then I heard this one from Shecky. When Letterman replaced Snyder, so obviously when Letterman went into NBC and got an office there. The office they gave him was Snyder's. And when uh, he walked into the room, Snyder had either written a note or written it on the walls because he figured they were going to paint the walls anyway, right? And it was a note to David Letterman. Please enjoy this office as much as I have and much success. Wow. That was really nice. You know, yeah. he could have just said, fuck you, you're replacing me, you know. <laughs> I hope you die. <laughs> yeah, I hope you, hope you die on your, on your own vomit, you know. Yeah. But uh, uh, anyway, so anyway, that was, uh, that, that's a little, little piece of trivia from the Letterman show a lot of people don't know. Uh, know and that's why, that's why in later years, Letterman put him on right after him when he was at CBS. Yeah, because he he remembered that, and he remembered what a fine guy Snyder was to him, and he also liked what Snyder did. In fact, for years, you know, Snyder was over at I think it was MSNBC or I can't remember all the places he was, but he he what he would do is he would take phone calls on his show. It was kind of a radio show. It went out as a radio show as well as a television show, and Letterman loved it. So he would call and get on the air and play all these different characters. And for a long time, Snyder 
Didn't even know it was David Letterman. Really? Yeah, yeah. So in the end, uh, he he felt a certain love for Tom Snyder and said, "Come on over here. I got to put on a show after me, and you would be the best possible person to do it." And that's what became the Late Late Show with Tom Snyder. So, yeah, little, little stories. Okay. What I liked about the Snyder show, it was the opposite of you. He did not have an audience. And for some reason, I felt when you watched Snyder, it was, he almost felt like he was in the living room talking to you. Well, Snyder had this wonderful quality, uh, if you go back and watch him, that he, when he talked to you, talked to the audience, he looked straight into that camera and talked to you. A lot of people will look. If you look at Johnny Carson, they say the reason Johnny Carson was such an enigma is if he, you watch his TV show, he comes out to, from the curtain, starts doing his monologue. He never looks straight ahead at the camera. He looks to one side, then he looks to another side. He's playing to the audience in the theater. Okay. Snyder never did that. Snyder played directly to the camera. And uh, Carson never played directly to the camera. So that, that, was, that was Snyder's biggie, in my opinion. I always liked that about him. But. Yeah, and he, uh, he, uh, his last uh, place of uh, residence was uh, Tiburon. Was it really? Yeah, and he actually he dropped by the Throckmorton one night, so. Oh, I thought you meant that's where he died. <laughs> he said he dropped. Oh, I think he by, did. Yeah, by the Throck, Throckmorton. He lived, no, <laughs> he lived in Tiburon. No, that's where I've died many nights. But uh, well, he retired from that show at CBS. He decided he retired, he, and I guess lived. In, so he must have done well to live in Tiburon. Oh, so. yeah, well, he did. Yeah, I think he did okay. I think uh, many years at NBC, and that that's how he made his big bucks. You know, terrific. But anyway, so that, that's that's some of the little stories about Dave and, and uh, uh, Tom Snyder. So how are you doing, my friend? How, uh, how? I'm surviving. I'm uh, thinking more and more about the uh, more. As you get older, you can't help but think about the mortality thing. <laughs> well, you see, you and I both fear death. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's why we are the way we are. And so when we start talking, it eventually always comes up, you know. I was just yeah, thinking. Well, Letterman what, mentioned that recently. He said at seventy-five, he said you have to think about it. Which is I wake up doing. every morning thinking about it, you know, because I'm not I'm not what I used to be. I can't. I'm not. I don't walk as well as I used to. You know, things like that. You know, and then I go, okay, so I want to live to be a hundred. Okay, what's I'm what's it going to be like when I'm a hundred? It's, it's got to be, you, you almost probably welcome death, you know? Yeah. How many, how many celebrities have lived to be 100? I mean, Carl Reiner was famously quoted as saying every morning the first thing he does is he opens up the paper, looks at the obituaries, and if his name isn't there, he then goes <laughs> on with his day, you know? Um, but well, I, think he, I think he made 99, didn't he? He may have made 100. Uh, he made he made ninety nine. That I know. Yeah, and now Mel Brooks, his best friend, is getting to that point. It wait, blows. Yeah. Wait a minute. Echo, how old? Echo, this is not responding to me. Echo, how old is Mel Brooks? Mel Brooks is ninety seven years old. Ninety seven years old. So, um, pretty old. I, you know, you may live a long life because you're a comedian. Comedians sometimes, the comedians either die young or they die old, really old. Uh, well, two have lived to be 100, uh, Bob Hope and uh, George Burns. George Burns, right? Yep, absolutely. And uh, who just died that was, I think he was 97, was Shecky Green. Really? Who I, who I thought had died years ago. <laughs> you know, there are those people that when they die, they go, you go, He's still alive, or was still alive? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just because you never hear from them for years, you know. Um, but uh, you have a, a, and the people who, some of the people who live the longest are actually actors. 
I mean, you had. Uh, I'm trying. To yeah, you were mentioning that guy that was in that Hitchcock movie. It was like 107. F- f- was pushed off of the. Uh, yeah, fell off of the uh, Statue of Liberty. I'm trying to remember his name right now because my mind's a blank. See, and then uh, then he had Olivia de Havilland. She was eight. She was 104, I think, when she died. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. All of these people weren't getting insurance from my union. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, but yes, our uh, wonderful union screwed us over. Yeah, it really screwed us over. Really screwed us over. Um, to where now I'm having to, you know, get my insurance. I pay a lot of money for health insurance now. I pay. I'm paying. Going to be paying. Marjorie's office was paying for, it, but it's, it's through in uh, April, and she. Uh, uh, we were we were pay, they were paying for each of us a hundred and twenty dollars three hundred and twenty dollars a month for supplemental to our Medicare. So you know that's but thank you Union for making it that much. It used to be two thousand dollars a year for the two of us when we were with the Union. So anyway, you know, and plus we had great dental as well. And since I'm getting old and toothless, uh, I need all the dental I can get, you know. Aren't you getting an implant? Uh, I got the implant. Wow. How's it work? Uh, Fine. You know, uh, the best kind of implants are implants you don't even notice you have. Sometimes I have to go back and figure out where they are. I have four of them. Really? Yeah. One, two, three, four. Yeah. Uh, In fact, the one I just got is in front of uh, one that I got before so you know but so far they all have worked pretty well you know uh, you don't hear about them particularly going bad although when they go bad they go bad and I think they just put in a new one that's all so and your insurance covered that uh, it, it, it covered part of it part of it you know they those <laughs> implants are expensive yeah, like five grand. Or well, something. why the government, for instance, with Medicare doesn't give you dental is beyond me. Because when you reach 80, 85, your teeth are going to hell, you know. And you could use yeah, the insurance acts like uh, they act like dental is not a health problem. It's insane. Yeah, they they, uh, they do not include any kind of dental pro, uh, coverage. There are things called Advantage, which are insurance companies that take over for Medicare. And you're no longer getting paid by Medicare. Uh, you're getting paid by these health insurance companies. And they offer plans that have, they say, and we have uh, dental coverage. Well, the dental coverage is two cleanings a year. That's it. You know, you don't get anything else. The rest of it is, uh, uh, you know. So, so uh, really, dental is probably more expensive even than medical at this point. It's getting ridiculous. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you want to get an implant over a bridge because bridges you have to take out and clean them. and uh, Not a bridge, but a, a, a denture, let's say. Uh, you have to you have to clean them and do all of that. But if you got yourself, uh, uh, you know, you, if, if you have to have your whole, all your bottom teeth taken out and put a, a denture in there, they can take that, they can put the, the, the bolts in your mouth, and then they can get the whole a whole denture and place it in there, and really, it's like you've got your own teeth back. But that's very, very, very expensive. I think that could cost you about twenty, thirty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. You know, government doesn't take care of it. So, and dental insurance—that's bullshit. Dental insurance—you get dental insurance, you pay for it. There's a deductible first of all, and then they only give you $1,500 a year. Well, in a dentist's office, you can eat that up just, you know, in deep root cleaning. Yeah. It it crowns, yeah. A crown will cost you uh, actually more probably than your insurance will cover. So you're always winding up putting money out of your pocket. I had to put, I have insurance, but I've, so, so far I haven't gotten the bill yet, but I'm sure I I owe my dentist uh, uh, oh about two three thousand dollars, so you know those things should be taken care of by the government too. Everything should be taken care of the government. I it just bothers me that Medicare is only eighty percent, right? 
and you got to come up with the other 20%. Yeah, and that 20% can easily bankrupt most people. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm paying $320 a month, all right? Now, that shouldn't be. I mean, what kind of country do we have where we don't care if people die because they don't have the money to have good medical care? That's it's cruel. It's terrible. God, we're a, God, we're a horrible country. You feel backwards in many ways, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. But your health's okay? I mean, how you, did you do so the... So far, yeah. Did you do the eyes yet? Uh, no, they're waiting for a reschedule on that and the hernia. The, uh, the hernia, yeah. I'm falling apart. I, I, I had a doctor see me, and he looked at the hernia, and he said, yeah, it's bulging, he said, but if it doesn't hurt and you can poke it back in, you're fine. Yeah, you know, they don't. They, they, if your doctor wants to do it, it's probably not because he wants to make the money, but because he thinks you need it. Because most doctors, I'm sure your doctor, even with that hernia, said, "Let's wait and see." You know, mm -hmm. until it gets uncomfortable, let's not do anything about it, because it, yeah, it's not a simple operation. You know, no, it's uh, not a good, not an easy recovery. So. Although we used to make jokes about hernia operations, didn't we? <laughs> As you get old, you don't make jokes about hernia operations, but no, all the things we joked about come back to haunt us. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, it, 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 it uh, you know, uh, but uh, you should, you should get the eyes done. That's a simple thing. Don't even worry. Yeah, about I it. heard that's really. Yeah, you told me that it's really simple. Yeah, it's it's a it's a breeze to walk in the park. It's just you know it's it's like everything else. It's annoying. I mean, you're sitting there and they're, they're literally po cutting into your eye and taking a lens out and putting a new one in. But you know, people go, "The Lord protects us. God willing, the Lord will take care of things." Blah blah blah. blah. You know that bullshit. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, if the Lord were that good, why is it man can put a better lens in your eye than you got from God? The Lord dropped the ball. <laughs> oh, he dropped the ball on that one. He dropped the ball on the prostate. You know, hey, I think I'll build a prostate that will take and put out the uh, the fluid with which the uh, sperm, which is made in your balls, uh, can go and whatever. Right? It's uh, terrible design. Yeah, but but I'll I'll just, where where can I put it? Well, I'll put I'll, I'll put something through it so that we can run the urethra right through this thing. That's a good idea. Yeah, that's superb yeah. engineering. The only thing is yeah, when you get uh, old and, <laughs> and, and the prostate enlarges, it clamps down on your urethra, and that's why guys get up in the middle of the night four times, five times, ten times to dribble out what they can dribble out. Thank you, God. You really designed a great body here. That's a worse design than Ford, you know. <laughs> yes, worse than the Edsel. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, you remember the Edsel? Boy. Uh, I remember my parents, talk, my parents talking about it. They always used to laugh that the, the grill looked like a toilet seat. Well, that that is not what the grill was meant to look like. At the time, S.I. Hayakawa, you remember the name? I do. Yeah, he became a chancellor at San Francisco State University. I think he also uh -huh. became a politician. But S.I. Hayakawa came out with a treatise on the sexual symbolism of the American automobile. And somebody at Ford read that and decided, yes, people buy cars because there's something in it that has sexual symbolism that they can relate to, uh, and uh, let's, uh, let's build a car. And in the front... Let's build something that looks like a vagina. Really? I never heard that. Yes, it was meant to look like a vagina. <laughs> and they wow. thought people would be running to these cars to buy them, or at least men. I don't, <laughs> I, I, I don't know, unless you wanted to have sex with the grill of your car, you know, it wasn't very practical. But that's what it was meant to be. I mean, what, is it, what did it look like? Yeah, the toilet seat. Well, toilet seat, but uh, toilet seats aren't that shape. They're rounder. What looks like that? I guess the VJ. Yeah. Well, I was watching. 
<laughs> last night I was watching uh, a thing with Bobby Slayton at one of these stand-up shows that he had done called Born to be Bobby. And he has the line that when God made the vagina, he should have put in a, he should have put in a, 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 what do you call it? A, a change machine, you know, <laughs> you know, where you click it and the, the quarters come out and so on and so forth. Should have built that right in because that's a real money maker. He says, in yeah, fact, don't you ever notice, hilarious. you ever notice that the vagina looks like you could take a credit card and swipe it in like at an ATM. <laughs> Classic. Oh, God. Anyway, hey, listen. Oh, whoa. We're running out of time here. It we go, are. goes fast with you, Bubs. It really does. It does, yes. Yeah. It's not. It's something I look forward to. I hope you do, too. Well, don't forget the Edsel was a big uh, failure. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was a big failure. Nobody wanted a car with a vagina. Ladies and gentlemen, Larry Bubbles Brown. Say goodnight, Larry. See you next week. Now in its ninth year, this is GabNet, the great American broadcast network. Talk like you've never heard it before. Well, hello there, everybody. How are you? Good to see you. Uh, we uh, didn't have a full show last night. We, uh, we turned it off at uh, about three minutes past 11 Eastern time. The reason was, and uh, let me explain it, is that uh, except for Jeff, who, who's always there for us most of the time, um, there was nobody calling. Nobody. Zero. Zilch. And I just decided, since uh, Amy didn't have a show going on that night, no reason why I couldn't sign off early, so I just said goodnight and spent the rest of the 24 following hours up until now depressed. Uh, and decided, trying to decide whether I was even going to do a show tonight because, quite frankly, it, it you know, I don't really need to anymore. Uh, which leads me to a thought that I've been having, and that uh, is, uh, oh, by the way, uh, somebody did try to call me last night, but they called me a few minutes, about a minute after I had signed off, and that was Don Geller. And he said, I heard you were having trouble, and I wanted to get you out of it. And he was going to call. So I want to give Don Geller his due props. Great guy. Just a great guy. But anyway, uh, I, I just, you know, I've just been trying to think of what to do here. Because I, I've never had that happen where nobody called, basically. I mean, Jeff called, but basically nobody called. And... Uh, I had to figure out what to do with it, you know. Uh, so I'm a lot of thinking. That I've been doing a lot of thinking today about what I want to do with the show and what I want to do with it. Uh, because at this time of night, I seem to get tired very easily these days. Now, that could just be because of my age, my declining years, you know, whatever. And that I just don't have the energy to, to do a show this time of night. So, you know, to then do a show this time of night, to put everything I've got into it, uh, and uh, as a result, the response I get from an audience is, eh, we don't really care. You know. Uh, he'll get along without us. See, it, it, we take him for granted. Uh, and so my thinking has been that at the very least, what I might do is move this show to like 1 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time, thereby making me a lot more awake than I am now. But uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking about doing that. Uh, and uh, I know it might inconvenience some of you who just, you know, wouldn't be able to call at that time. But it'll be a whole new audience that'll be available to me. And I'm just thinking about doing that because, quite frankly, I don't need the kind of crap I put up with last night, you know. And uh, on top of that, nobody seemed to notice that I wasn't on last night. So that also is doubly hurtful. So anyway, uh, I, I don't know how to, how to put it any more abruptly than that. But some changes have got to be made. I just I can't keep doing this, and not getting the reward out of it, you know. And the reward is not money. 
the reward is an audience, you know. So, anyway, look at that. Look at that. See that? I, ne I can't figure out what that is. Ah. It's just really dark there. If I shine a light on it, it goes away. So, anyway. Uh, I, I was at my dentist today. My dentist, by the way, has uh, the office in New York City had to be closed down, and they're moving into a new one, but it's taking forever to get that one going. So my dentist picks me up and drives me to Scarsdale. <laughs> so we did that today. And then I went there to get a, a crown put in that they had made up for me. And I put the crown in. She put the crown in, and she said, well, she says, it fits, but there's a gap between the tooth ahead of it and this one, and I don't like it that way. So she said, uh, let, we're gonna send it back and have them redo it. So now I gotta go back in two more weeks, but they're gonna pick me up again. But I wind up spending like three hours there because I gotta wait till they go home to drive me home. So anyway, that's, uh, that's what's been going on in my life. Boy, is it exciting, huh? Can't believe it. Well, we have some people tonight, uh, and we'll, uh, let's see here. Let's, uh, let's just uh, admit all these people here, and let's see them as they come on. Three hours. There's uh, Charlene, and there's uh, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, for being there last night for me. I appreciate it. Uh, Alan, uh, Josh. Uh, yes. Charlie Wallace and your camera is really not bright at all, Brian. What is that all about? Just uh, moving you know, my stuff back. I tried to fix something, but yeah. uh, do you know? Did you notice that there is one of your favorite callers who actually said sorry this morning at seven thirty-five and sent you a message, or you didn't see that? No, I didn't. Where did you send the message? <laughs> the only way I know how to communicate to you. Which is how? Through, through Facebook or? Smoke signals. <laughs> oh, through, through whatever messenger, Facebook or something, I don't know, whatever. Facebook, probably. Yeah, through Facebook. Yeah. I sent you a message this morning and said, sorry, I was logging on late. And... Huh. Hey, it can't rain every Thursday, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Thursdays are notoriously bad for you. Yeah. Yeah. What was your excuse, Alan? Huh? What was your excuse? Well, I was having dinner with my mother hmm. and trying to get a 90-year-old woman to eat more quickly so I can get to my show doesn't work well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm. But anyway, so here we all are. Hello, and Josh. I forgot Josh. Josh, I know, was working last night, right, Josh? Yes, I was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that good. that's the way it goes, folks. Oh man, I got the I got I have this air conditioning and I got to turn it up even more. It has been so hot here today. You know, how's it down where? You, well, Texas is supposed to be terrible, right? Ninety-seven today. It was a nice, cool. Ninety-seven. Yes. <laughs> and and I know that part of the world. What is this? I'm trying to figure out my camera. Okay. Just, just okay. keep talking, keep talking, Wait, keep oh, talking. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh much better go. picture. I know. Yeah. I can't, I can't look good all the time. Yeah. Well, thank you for sending me a note. I didn't see it. When, I, when you sent it to Facebook? Yeah, I sent it to Facebook. Like I, that's the only way I know how to communicate to you. Yes. Yeah. Let me see here. Facebook. It's okay. Don't, don't feel bad or anything. It's okay. Just keep going. I, I have his phone number. Let me see here. You're lucky. Facebook I there. don't have Facebook so anymore. Well, there's Facebook. And uh, let me see here. Hmm. Did I get one? There it is, Brian Neary. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't see it. It didn't uh, It didn't flag itself. As it okay, I accept your apology. Sorry about last night. I just missed logging in on uh, a bit late. I uh, hope you have a great day. Thank you very much, Brian. I appreciate it. Okay, does that make everything better? 
Yeah. Feel yeah. Now. Well, no, that, that, that's, that's very nice of you. <laughs> yeah. I would have logged in about 15 minutes late, but you weren't here, so. Yep. Did you, did you think I was dead or something? No. I don't know what. I thought maybe you had technical problems again. No, I don't have technical problems. I got to go out and buy this new, uh, this new uh, Apple Studio <coughs> for here. For the uh, one day a week that you want to do the show? Huh? <laughs> for the one day a week that you want to do the yeah, show? Yeah, well, I do other stuff. I edit video and things like that, and that's what it's very good for, too. But I'm getting a very powerful version of this machine. Yeah. Uh, uh, 29 minutes after you get yours, Bill will have to get his, too. Well, he has one. Oh, but he would have to spend a little bit more money and buy a new one to get what I'm getting. So, well, he's saving a lot of money on weekends. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, we're good. It's gonna have uh, it's gonna have more power all the way around. So, I'm not that I'm not happy with this. I could live with this machine, but since I got a bit of money, I figured I wanted to buy a toy. So that's the so toy. If you did your show at one o'clock Eastern, that would be. That, that would be four o'clock. <laughs> It'd be ten o'clock your time in the ten morning. Ten o'clock, not four o'clock. Oh yeah, it'd be ten o'clock in the morning. Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, that mean you, you can would... almost guarantee you'll never well, see. Is that me. is that time inconvenient for you? <laughs> is that time? I'm in... sleeping. Oh, you so are great for me. Good. Then I'm definitely going to start doing it at one o'clock in the afternoon. Charlie, Charlie won't fall asleep. Uh, Charlene's had her hand up for a while. Yeah. What would happen to Amy, Alex, if if you uh, do that? Well, I don't would know. She, she would still be on, you know, at twelve o'clock. I have no idea. I have no idea. Have yeah. her come on your time slot and watch everybody call her. <laughs> She would probably like being in your time slot, actually. Yeah, I'm sure she would. Yeah, because well, she gets tired sometimes. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I th that's what I'm saying is that I think I could do a better show at uh, these days at one o'clock in the afternoon. How many here would be available at one o'clock in the afternoon? I. Yeah. I'd try to make time. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You, you got three people. <laughs> I have to yeah. put a meeting in my Outlook, so I am busy that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll schedule it in. Yeah. I'm wired but, awake by one o'clock. <laughs> but we'll keep it the way it is for the time being. I don't want to inconvenience you people. Thank you. <laughs> East Coast. Yeah, thank you. West Coast people. What's his name? Of? Alex? Yeah. I'm sorry, you know, I don't want you to lose the audience and everything because this is kind of depressing and everything. And you said, you know, you aren't dead. I'm so glad you aren't. Gone because I woke up this morning and my mom had passed away. Oh, so no. don't, don't don't make me cry like you did, Tony. But you know, uh, well, uh, you know, I'm a right. boss. Well, well, he didn't cry you, about everybody. his mother. He cried about his aunt. Aunt. Yeah. 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 And he called me up on the show one day and he said, uh, "I'm not feeling very good. My aunt died today." And I said, "Well, you know what, Tony? What? I never liked her anyway." Now, the reason I said that is that Penn Jillette once told me that's sometimes the best thing you can do because you lighten the subject. You know, nobody, nobody feels that you really, if I said that to you just now about your mother, you'd know I wasn't serious, you know, okay. that I was just trying to make you laugh a little. So. Yeah. A lot of people today you know, have been making me laugh, yeah. sort of. And How old I feel was better. she, by the way? 94 she just had her birthday on the 17th and mother's day yeah, yeah. and i woke up this morning and pff, that was it you gotta mm -hmm. feel the way about it that i felt when my mother died mm -hmm. i felt now there are going to be more parking spaces right you know yeah. i mean it, what i thought about was how many people have parents who die in their 80s or maybe their 70s or their 60s or whatever and uh, my mom was 37. Your mom 37 was 37 when she died. Your mom was 37. My mom was your mother's 37. still alive, right, Dallin? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is your parent mother still alive, uh, uh, Josh? Uh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. How about you, Charlie? 
No, my mom's been dead for 26 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I thought when my mother died at 100 was I could sit here and feel really bad. But, you know, to begin with, everybody dies eventually. And you're really mm -hmm. lucky to have her for that many years. Yeah. yeah. That's Thank you, real, Alex. Real that makes blessing. me feel better. Yeah, it's a real blessing. But mm -hmm. to feel really sorry about it, it doesn't mm -hmm. make a hell of a lot of sense. Yeah. Right. It's not going to do anything and bring her back or something. It's not going to do anything to bring her back. And it, it flies in the face of all those people who lose their parents really young, you know? Mm -hmm. Th that, those are the people who, if they want to be miserable, I'll have them cry on my shoulder, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it just be happy. She lived a great life. She had a great daughter. And, uh, you know. And now you've got a spare cane. Yeah. And just to balance the books, mm -hmm. my daughter told us today that she's expecting. Ooh. Oh, congratulations, Charlie. Well, really? At the is age it, of 74. It, it, <laughs> oh, you, you never have... bore before? Oh, no. I thought maybe you were before. No? Three Your kids daughter is 74? No. So you're going to be a grandfather. Yeah. yeah, congratulations there, yeah. Charlie. Wow. I hear that's the best thing. Mm -hmm. It's almost yeah, better than having a kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you can lavish everything you want to on these kids. But and at the end of the day, the parents pick them up and take them home. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Tell wonderful. You yeah. did get the cane, right, Charlie? Oh, yes. And she got some use out of it. Yeah, oh, really? thank you, Alan. Yeah, oh, when I took her, you're welcome. I'm, I'm I took sorry her to the podiatrist Thursday, and you know he's going to be shocked. You know that I'm. She, I'm sorry uh, that you. It didn't give yeah. her good luck and make her last another year. Yeah, but I will save it because I. I'm going to need one. Okay. Yeah. I, I can use one now a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they're nice, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Oh, beautiful! Yes, it's beautiful. Thank you. Oh, I'm getting good use out of the cane he sent me. And I sent mm -hmm. your wife one too. I sent her mother one. So yeah, I should go into the cane business. You really yes, should. You should. <laughs> I am thinking again now that I am using a cane quite often, although I didn't use it today. Um, I, I'm thinking of getting a really nice cane of some sort. You know, something that people look at it and go. With oh, all but, this money you got, why don't you get a diamond crusted cane? Well, no, I'm not going to waste that much money on a goddamn cane, okay? But for 50 bucks, you can get one that has like a wolf's head on it, you know. Or, or you can get a, a sticker that says Ferrari to stick on it. What? A Ferrari sticker to, to put on the cane, you know? Why would I do that? <laughs> because it would be expensive. I don't know. I mean, maybe I, that might be a good idea for, uh, for Brian. Because he's mm, a car guy. That's what I was thinking. I don't think he's using the cane yet. No, Not he's yet. he's got a few years till the cane. <clears throat> do you use a cane at all, Alan? Yes, <laughs> you do. I had I, I blew out my meniscus about six years ago, and it worked really good. Yeah, well, I uh, I got a meniscus problem too. So meniscus. Knee three. It's in your my, your knee area. Yeah, my knee has a torn meniscus too. I have a torn they, meniscus. They don't like doing surgery on them anymore. How many people yeah. here have a torn meniscus? Mm. See? It's How about not that uncommon. It feels yeah. good. It feels fine. So how are you doing, Josh? Pretty well. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, you know, guys. I figured this week, Josh, that since the trial is on hiatus, mm. um, that since it's on hiatus, that we wouldn't have to hear about Donald Trump. And you tune in MSNBC, and they can't stop talking about him. They have a whole week to not even mention his name, and they can't do it. And they have yet to learn the lesson that they should have learned from 2016 when they got him elected by just talking about him too much. Yeah, well, I mean, they're, uh, they stay on it. That's their deal, you yeah. know, and he, of course, is out there saying some, <laughs> you know, pretty outrageous stuff the last couple of days. So he gives them plenty of material to have 
guests and things on to go over and keep people watching. So, what did he say now? Money making deal. I'm sorry. What did he say now? Well, I mean, I heard some bits and pieces of that speech that he gave in New York, uh, in the Bronx, uh, at a park somewhere. I don't know where. Yeah. Uh, I think it must have been yesterday, uh, maybe. Um, you know, again, with the immigration thing, uh, you know, we don't know who these people are. They don't speak our language. Oh, uh, when they gather in these large areas with all these tents and they've all got these wood-fired stoves, um, he's convinced that they all have some kind of plan and that this isn't, they're not just homeless, that they're kind of working together. And his words were, he thinks they're going to get us from within, you know, insinuating that they are basically, I, I guess, you know, going to form together and make some kind of a military force or something you know i mean was the way that i took it maybe if you don't want to take it that way if they're not going to do it by force then they're going to do it by silent coup uh you know I'm not, <laughs> somehow you know by replacing all of us with they'll be the new us by taking our jobs and votes and whatever so you know and then again promised the uh, uh most an immediate largest you know uh deportations and removals you know in our history and uh you know the same thing basically but worse and you know if that was all followed up by you know his folks going around telling everybody that Biden tried to assassinate him because in the warrant to search his premises there was language in there that said you know they could use deadly force, which is actually not at all what it said. But his what folks. Did, what got, did it say exactly? Uh, it said the same thing that all of them say, including the same warrant that was served on Joe Biden's Joe Biden. home. That it says agents, you know, it's just a guideline for agents really not to use deadly force. It basically reminds them of, if you will, of their rules of engagement, you know, of when to draw their weapon and when to use their weapon. It's sort of a last minute reminder that says even if someone gets mouthy even if someone throws a lamp down even if someone's stomping around the room remain calm and try not to shoot them so how do, how does that translate into they said use deadly force well it doesn't but that doesn't matter all he's got to do is say that and all he's got to do yeah. is have other people say that and then people will talk about it for weeks yeah. uh, personally i don't really understand why the administration doesn't just say, well, it doesn't say that, but even if it did, what's the big deal? This man's own lawyers were the very people that made the argument this was legal. So it doesn't make uh, any Alan, difference. you've got your hand up. So, so they're federal police officers. It's an escalation of force issue. And if somebody in, in the, where he was searching, where they were, FBI were searching the warrant, um, which is legal reason to be on the property or in the property or whatever, if somebody came at him with a knife or something, I mean, what are they supposed to do? You know, spit on the guy? No, they're gonna they're gonna try and stop him, and if they can't, then they'll use deadly force. That's. Can but I it's... ask you yeah. why people uh, use deadly force to protect themselves? I mean, you can't shoot him in the leg. Um, well, if a guy's shooting at you and you shoot him in the leg. You might piss him off, and he might continue to shoot. But you so want to stop the threat. You know, suppose he's just coming at you. I mean, they still shoot him anyway. Well, actually, an interesting thing happened yesterday in San Francisco. A man was reported with a rifle, and San Francisco police uh, found the guy in Bayview Hunters Point, where they said he was. And it was a loaded rifle, and they shot him with a less than lethal round. It comes out of a shotgun with an orange handle and that beanbag rubber balls. I, they didn't specify. And it and it hurts. And it stopped the guy, and the guy wasn't shot, and they arrested him, and it was over with. Mm. So some, sometimes you have that option. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I guess regardless of that, you know, basically the, you know, the paragraph that they're losing their minds over is 
you know, what's been described by dozens of people that I would trust is, listen, this is, this is just copied and pasted into every search warrant that's served, yep. you know, Absolutely. by this uh, entity, the, Fed the FBI. Mm -hmm. yep. you know? So they're like, you know, they, this is one of a half a dozen paragraphs that's in every search warrant that as they write the warrant, when they get to the part about this, they go to the other monitor on their screen, they copy, they paste, they keep going, they find the next area, they copy, they paste, they write the specifics, they copy, they paste. It's, it's in every, you know, so it somehow turned into, you know, they were going to try to have him killed. So, I mean, this is this is just in the last couple of days. It's, it's kind of bizarre. You Especially know. since he wasn't even there. That's what they, I was just going to say. He wasn't even there. Right. Right. Yeah, when he wasn't there on, on purpose. They waited until he wasn't there to do the raid. Yeah, so, I mean, this is all bizarre, and it's just... I mean, I, I want this, this stuff to be over, and, you know, mm -hmm. hopefully it turns out the way we need it to, because, you know, I'm, I'm just I'm getting tired of it. I mean, I'm just, you know, I mean, <laughs> I'm telling you that I'm a little shocked in a way and some other ways that I'm not that you know, the rise of fascism in this country is coming back slowly but surely. And I'm, I'm just telling coming you coming back or is no is it's uh, been here. I mean, well, it how bad has it been here in the past? You know, I mean, we've had fascism. Well, I don't know that it's really been here in, in the past. So I don't know that I should specify it to this country, but. You know, uh, Joe McCarthy. Uh, well, I mean, during World War II, mean, there were people here in this country who were pro Hitler. Uh, but right, anytime yeah. you have somebody like a Hitler and you have things going on in this country, there's going to be a group of people doing that. That's sure, just, right. you know, par for the course. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we've had any kind of. Well, no, I don't, I don't think like we've we had a sustained, now. you know, movement or infiltration within our, you know, to or to the level to not to the level that I see. I mean, I see it now. It's permeated into yeah. political leaders, to the government, you know, to the business world in in some ways. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's very dangerous if you ask me. Um, and I think other people agree. It's it's very dangerous, and it's starting to become worrisome. And it makes me sad in a way, angry in another, and you know, a little sick. I mean, this is. You know, this is what makes me sick, you know, like I, I tried to say, you know, a few months ago or whatever, is you, I, I don't care what you think she was saying or what, I, you, you couldn't trust Nikki Haley. She's part of a party that you just can't trust. And I hate to say it, but I was right. Because yeah. she turned around and did exactly what I thought she would do. And, and I, she will not be the last one that well, you, you know, think why could she couldn't the corner, and I'm telling you, they haven't. Why she couldn't just say... Uh, uh, I'm not going to uh, vote for Donald Trump, but then again, I'm not going to vote for anybody. I mean, if that yeah. was her view, that is certainly the right that people have. I can't bring Trump myself right to, vote to vote for him, for Trump, but I can't way. bring saying, myself to vote for Joe Biden. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, she also has the, road, the, the right to vote for Trump, but I'm just saying her point was that, oh, well, I have to vote for Trump because Biden is just so bad and dangerous for our country. Oh, give me a break. I mean, give me a fucking I don't think break. in America anybody should have to vote for the lesser of two evils. If you feel there are two evils, then you don't vote for either of them. Well, and they you are stay home. I'm sorry, you yeah, stay yeah. home. That's an option. They could do that. Yeah. Uh, well, no I mean, one is denying well, anyone that, that right. I uh, Somebody said to me, well, then you lose your right to bitch. And I said, no, I don't. Well, no, Whoever made that you statement you up, you know? Right. Well, who would really care who she votes for? Why couldn't she just go vote in silence? Right. right. Oh, you got could her vote financial for somebody gain else. And, and her... Look, I mean, she got a financial gain out of it because she now has a job with this Hudson Institute where she made the announcement. Okay? She, mm -hmm. she's, she stands to gain a lot of money. And I'm sure that she was promised in some ways by certain people that... In 2028, they would try to support her as a front runner, because if Trump is reelected, he will only be allowed to serve that one term. So they're guaranteed to have a new Republican nominee, or at least they all think they do. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's wait and see. But, you know, so this is, I mean, a cheap person 
who who can't be trusted. I mean, that's what I'm saying. She's a low life, cheap person to sell herself for a fucking nickel to a bunch of racist and a bunch of fascists. Yep. You know, and if there, I mean, I can almost put, I tell you what, and I don't care if it's controversial. I can almost put up with a racist because I've known a lot of them that are actually some pretty decent people who just have a a little bit of a misunderstanding in their mind about how things really work. The one thing that I cannot put up with is a fascist. I can't stand them. You know? I mean, so that's what that party is is becoming. I mean, they and this to me, by the they're way, starting to say, out, say, starting to say it out loud in a way. They're not even some of them aren't even denying it anymore, and that's when you know it's taking a turn for the Josh, worse. this is as bothered as you seem to have been since I've known you. Well, yeah, because I'm, I, I'm, I'm tired of hearing the 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 crap that he has to say, which is one thing because it has nothing to do with policy arguments. I mean, if he wants to just run for president and have policies that I absolutely cannot stand, that's perfectly fine. But the normalization of the political violence and all of this racially motivated and this nationalistic rhetoric is incredibly stupid and it's incredibly dangerous you know and and that's what people are missing i'm telling you the signs are all there i know what many of them are very well i spent a great deal of time around it and, and you know again when they when people in a movement like that get to the point where they no longer think that they have to tell you that and like code or talk in a circle about it, they can just outright say it. That's really to me where they're at. I mean, you know, so, I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you know, in 1937 or 1938, earlier before that, but certainly then no one was really secretly a Nazi, you know, they were like, yeah, I'm a member of the Nazi party. You're right. I want to, I want to, a true, a true Germany, you know, I mean, I mean, they were, they, they were proud of that. And it's getting that way here slowly, a little bit more every day. Yeah. I want a real America. I mean, you know, and then you start asking what that means. And before they used to stammer and now, you know, there's, their speech has picked up a little bit. Well, you know, there's one aspect <clears throat> of Donald Trump that I don't understand why his people, like I assume that if you're a, a proud boy, and you carry a gun, you consider yourself tough, right? But Trump has turned into a whiny little bitch. Yeah. All he does is whine and moan and bitch and moan and moan and bitch and bitch and moan, you know? Yeah. But every Republican today seems to be supporting him. They all go in lockstep. Well, but yeah, that, that's but what I'm saying. That rhetoric is easy to get going. I mean, you know, vote for me because I'm going to fix Germany from all of those people who ruined it and all those people who let the rest of Europe ruin it for you, and those people were Jews. Well, all oh, I know is he's a white... My whiny, life is shitty because of Jews. You see him in court. Wow. In, in court I mean, every you know, day. In court every day. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Jimmy Kimmel did something interesting the other night because one thing... What is... Do you know what Trump's been complaining about in those little speeches he gives outside of the courtroom? His main complaint about the courtroom? It's cold. How cold it is. Yeah, I remember what you were saying. Man. Somebody <laughs> took a thermometer in there, and it was 72 degrees. That's perfect. Come on. <laughs> And he's supposed to wear a really I keep it here on 68. I mean, uh, he's a whiny little bitch. That's what he is. Does anybody know what he's going to do if he gets elected? I mean, he's going to do good. He hasn't said, I'm going to lower taxes. I'm going to. He hasn't talked for one moment about what he plans to do in this country. And, and he never did. And he's, he well, must, you know. And yet, there remember, are people. Like, I mean, I think, quite frankly, Americans should use, lose their right to vote because they don't vote responsibly. Yeah, I mean, it's... But, I mean, the only thing that he's really mentioned is is about his settling of grievances, you know? Yeah, that's what Listen, he said. If you, wanna, if you wanna grind it down to simplicity, Nazism it wasn't so much a, a, a party about racial purity, it was a party about 
grievances. By the way, if you think about this for a moment, everybody who's watching and listening to this program, all three of you. (laughs) I know one. (laughs) uh, In 2016, look at how he was in 2016. Pretty disgusting, right? Well, how, how much older is he now? Oh, eight years older? Eight years. People only get worse. They don't get better. I think and quite right. frankly, yeah. I think he's totally lost his mind. Yeah. You know? Ooh. And the thing is, like like before, you know, the scariest thing for me is then who who does he want to get in after him? Let, let's say he get he goes another four years. Who's he going to line up next? Aaron. You know, he, he wants to start lining up his family. I mean, yeah. you start, you know, Josh talking about fascism. It's like, you know, the, this whole regime of his family, you know, he, he's going to... He wants to take over and the Trumps be, you know. Well, like, I don't think he thinks anybody's going to take over from him. He's going to find a way to get another term. He's going to stay until he dies. Change the Constitution. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he said he wants to Bree Bri has something to say here. Yes, Bree. No, I'm just saying he said that he wants to try. He wants to make it so that the uh, president can start three terms. Right. That takes a constitutional amendment. Yep, just said that. Hmm. Well, we certainly, could, yeah. we certainly, after uh, Roosevelt, felt that four terms was way too many. Okay, yeah. and the reason we settled on two on on two two terms was that uh, you know that's that seemed reasonable. Well, that was I think three. That, three was, the, three. that was the general accepted amount as the example was set by Washington. Yeah. yeah, but not, not everyone said if either. two terms was good enough for George Washington, it's good enough for me. Yeah, but but, not, but they but they didn't three. set it. They, they excuse me, Brian. I'll come to you in a second. Yeah. They didn't right. put into law the fact that it was right. going to be you know two terms, three terms, whatever. So people could run as long as they kept winning. Yeah. In in the right. case yeah. of Roosevelt, he kept being elected because there was a war on, and people didn't want to change horses yeah. in midstream. Yes, Brian. Not three terms when they're eighty years old, though. Come on. Please. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. He yes. won't make that. I, I hate. I'm not trying to be ageist, but there should be a limit. Should we actually have a law against how old you can be to run for president? <laughs> we got to have those so. tests, right? Those cognizance tests or whatever, you know. Have them run one of those and see how still alert. They well, you said have. no. You said no, Bree. You feel a person could be like ninety and still run for president? Absolutely, yeah. sure. Yep. Do you think he would be competent at that age? Depends my on that. my mom is ninety one, and she's more competent. I, I, yeah, your mother's than your, Biden your, or Trump together. <laughs> your mother's sharp as a tack, but she isn't running for president, and she is, doesn't well, have to hold down that job every deal. day. That's for the electorate to decide, but you know, I, I'm not. I would be against any age limit. I'm 84. I know what it's like to be 84. Okay, I think I'm fairly sharp on this show, right? I don't. I yep. don't think you I'm are. Yes. Right? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. I believe me. I don't think I could do the job right now if I if you wanted me to be president. Uh, uh, you know. So, Too much. Uh, how old is Joe Biden going to be when he's finally in his last year? He's going to be about 84, isn't he? 85? 86. 86. He's already 80. You know, speaking as an older person, you're not being ageist when you say, hey, maybe you should give up at a certain time. You know? He might, he can, he might quit. What? He might quit in two years. If, if he became president again. Well, then we get what's her name as president. <clears throat> the vice president. Yeah. 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 You know my position on that, Alex. You know, let's not go round and round. But she was, she didn't even make it through the Democratic primary. No. So yeah. She was selected by the elites. And yeah, this is exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just disagree. Well, you know, I think one of, the, one of the problems I think that Biden had is running again. He didn't do the Democratic Party any great service by running again. But as long as he was going to run again, he should have had at his back as vice president somebody that America could go, I can live with that person as president. I don't think they can say that about Kamala Harris. I can say that. You can say that? Yeah, I can live with her as president. Why? 
Yeah, why? <laughs> why? Well, one thing, she's not going to appoint any more Alitos and Clarence Thomas. Well, but that's, a, that, we, that's a given if it's a Democrat, right? She's not going to do that, of course. Uh, but that's not, that's not what we're saying here. What we're saying here is, do you feel confident at her being good, uh, uh, holding down the job of president and doing mm -hmm. a good job of it? Well, when Roosevelt died and we got a new president, right? How does he work out? To well, be Truman a was considered a, a real lox, you know? Uh, he, they didn't think he was going to be a very good president. He became a better president than they ever imagined he would be. But then again, how old was Truman? Truman wasn't, he was like maybe in his 60s, you know. I think, let me see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you looking it up, Bree? I'm going to look it up. Truman, right? At the end? I Truman, how old was he? Let me take a look here. Oh, uh, he wasn't that old. Maybe like 67. Yeah. Oh, was he that old? I didn't think he was that old. I think, I, to be honest with you, I think the age uh, Obama was is a perfect age for a person to be president. He's like well, alert and care. alive. And he, he, 50 something or? Yeah, I can't imagine how difficult that job on a day-to-day -day basis is. You know? Yeah, he was 60. Yeah. 60, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And he lived till 88. Yeah. German, yeah. Wow. I didn't know wow. he lived he that. He died long. in 1972. Wow. Wow. I didn't realize that, yeah. Yeah. And he had to make one of the toughest decisions any president ever had to make. Yeah, he did. You know, uh, I don't know if it I was had to, I watched that. There what? was a show. There's a museum in New York, the Museum of Radio and Television. I don't know if it's still there. You could go in and you could watch any show from any time. And I watched one, the decision to drop the bomb, and it, it was, you know, it was a documentary about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, the, it, 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 who knows whether it was a good decision or a bad decision. Uh, all I know is that we dropped it. It had such devastating consequences that in spite of all the countries in the world that now have nuclear devices, none have ever used them like that. We're yeah. the only people that have ever dropped it on a, a human population. United and I think States. if we know now what we didn't know then, mm -hmm. I don't think we would have dropped it. I think we would have thought twice about it. Yeah. Obama was the second youngest president ever elected. Who was Only the youngest? Kennedy was younger. Kennedy was, Kennedy was the youngest. JFK? Yeah. yeah. Was younger yeah. than him. Wow. Teddy Roosevelt. How, how was yeah. What, the what, first what, what happened to Bree? It looks like he froze. <laughs> yes, uh, Tony. They're saying, in, uh, when they, I'm looking at Wikipedia, so I don't know if it's, I guess it could be accurate. When they dropped the bomb, they, they estimated almost 126,000 people died. Wow. Yeah. Yes. Um, Probably 100 of those died instantly or very really soon. Yeah. There was nuclear fallout, too, and people died slowly. And people died from cancer and crap and from radiation burns and all that stuff yep. for years. Yep. After them. Yep. Yep. It ended the war. It got its point. Yep. I don't... Did it, it... But the question is... There are there are is some thinking, and maybe Jace, uh, maybe Josh can uh, put, come in on this particular subject, that the war was almost over anyway. That we had pretty much made enough inroads that we could have, that more Americans would have died in the process. I grant you that, but uh, this just short circuited that. But that they, we would have, we were on the way to winning that war anyway. Have, it, have other people heard that? Well, we were on the way to winning the war, probably, you know, regardless. But uh, the war doesn't end any time around August of 1945 without the atomic weapons. Yeah. I mean, it probably doesn't end until August of 1946 or later. Um, and probably lose at least another 100,000 Americans, if probably more, but certainly that. I mean... Plus, we had the bomb. 
Uh, right. And we're the only one who had one. You know, the, the blockade theory was working, but was going to take at least another year. Uh, you know, the various other options were, were not really all that great. Um, you know, I, I would again offer as evidence that, you know, uh, the atomic bomb wasn't needed, yet it took two atomic bombs before they surrendered, you know? Well, that's the part yeah. of you, Bruce, that I can't understand. Is that if yep. you, if Well, you the had... reason that it took two was because during, you know, the few days, uh, most Japanese were ready to surrender, but there was a hardline element within the Japanese government and military that wanted to never surrender, ever. And I mean ever. I mean, they wanted to be either victorious or eradicated from the face of the earth, and just after the dropping of the second atomic bomb, there was an attempted coup on the emperor and the emperor's life that was staved off at the last minute, and some of those high military commanders were summarily executed. Hmm. Uh, and then the emperor decided to surrender. So, I mean, it took two atomic bombs and a failed coup. Mm -hmm. So I, I would offer that in itself as pretty strong evidence that the war wasn't going to end anytime soon. But there's also another entirely academic argument where you could address five or six different points, like the blockade and a few other things if you wanted, that would also lay it out for you. But the first part, I think, is simple enough. Did we make. tell Japan that we were going to drop a second bomb on them unless they... Yes. We did. Yes. And they didn't surrender. Told them we would drop a third. What, what, yeah, I know we had a third. Did we have a third one waiting? I believe so, yeah. Not it, so it, not so fast. The boy. logistics of that were questionable. I mean, yeah. we didn't really have... Well, there was a third one because they tested the first one. Y yeah. So well, there were three bombs. Really there were three bombs. The there, were, there was the one that we trust, you know, Trinity... And then there were the two we dropped. Now, whether there was another one waiting, I have no idea, or how fast yeah, they could the get. The Japanese couldn't take a chance. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there were other, you know, like I said, they kicked around a few other ideas, you know. I mean, they, you know, that, that again, I don't think would have worked. You know, I mean, they, you know, one of the ideas was to invite some Japanese high command to a demonstration in a remote Pacific area of a bomb. They wanted to basically just go bomb a deserted island and let the Japanese yeah. watch and tell them, if you don't surrender, we'll drop these. You know, but then they gave up. They would have given up their element of surprise, which would have yeah. opened up uh, the crews that dropped the bomb to enormous uh, hmm. risk. Uh, yeah. And But second of all, I mean, why would a demonstration have worked? The dropping of the actual bomb didn't, didn't work. work. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, we, that tells me a demonstration would not have worked. We came close to losing one of the bombs, the USS Indiana. I don't know something. Uh, yeah. was, was the ship that took it there quietly, the Tinian Island, and on its way back, it got torpedoed and sunk. Yep. 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 Yeah. Indianapolis was the name. Indianapolis. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was on the delivery, you know, of, of the first two. So, I mean, the, I mean, I don't think we had a lot of choice. Was there. that FedEx or UPS? Yeah. Fed up. U.S. Navy. Mm. Even more reliable than FedEx and UPS. I just can't imagine that they saw that what that bomb did in Hiroshima, and they didn't say, okay, we give up. Well, they, they did. Yeah. Matter of fact, like I said, after the second one, they said there were high military commanders who tried to kill the emperor and take a, or imprison the emperor, whichever they could do, and take over the government in the name of, we will never surrender, ever. Yeah. Wow. Uh, we will fight. Was that, here, was that Hirohito? Yeah. I thought I had the wrong name. The guy was Hirohito in Japan? Or, or no, I'm wrong. Was it Hirohito? Yeah, I think so. And not the uh, emperor. Huh? But the... Uh, I mean, there were just, I mean, there was a steadfast group within, you know, Japanese high command that was prepared to fight on forever. I mean, obviously there were some others, 
really the majority that said, you know, we're, we're finished here, we're through, you know, we need to make terms. But there was a sizable amount, you know, within the government that wasn't prepared for that. In the end, it was ultimately, the, you know, the emperor's decision. And the sort of... Okay, let me ask, let me ask you. The leaked message to the Japanese was that your condition, you know, your surrender will be unconditional, but we left some breadcrumbs there that basically spelled out, but we will not remove your emperor. You know, and that was enough for them to accept. We, we will not remove your emperor. Correct. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, that was another one of their biggest fears was that if they surrendered, that we would put their emperor on trial for war crimes and, you know... Why, were were, were there hand. any war crimes trials, though, for Japanese, like we had well, with... Yeah, the, there were war crimes trials for all various, you know, part... I mean, you know, the Japanese, you know, in some ways were just as... They committed as many atrocities as the Nazi early in that war, just not necessarily always against Americans. I mean, their treatment of the Chinese in that invasion was absolutely... As bad as the Nazis in by the way, speaking in of Germany war, or the uh, Soviets. Speaking of war crimes, how do you people feel about the Hague now has told Israel that they have to stop doing their actions in Rafa, uh, and that uh, also that uh, uh, what's his name uh, Netanyahu and three of the Hamas leaders are all supposed to stand stand uh, go to what, what's the term I'm behind them a hundred percent yeah well I'm saying but the question is there isn't a damn thing they can do about it well. you know I mean the fact that they've charged them I think is wonderful and I think it tells Netanyahu hey the world isn't with you now yeah you know what's strange you had a guy like Netanyahu, who, when this thing first went down with Hamas, had the sympathy of the world. Yep. And squandered that. Just squandered that. The rest of the world would have been at his back helping him do whatever was right to solve the problem. It, but it's terrible. It's just terrible, you know, that he squandered all of that. And the thing that really gets me most of all is the thing that always I had a great fear of. Uh, somebody was saying that too many people have equated Hamas with Palestinians. And so Palestinians should not be thought of in the same word as Hamas. Palestinians are not necessarily members of Hamas. But uh, haven't they done the same thing uh, with, with uh, Hamas with Jews and considering all Jews to be enemies of Hamas. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this this distinction of <laughs> suddenly making everybody guilty who is Jewish simply because of the acts of Israel, they sh it shouldn't be. It just shouldn't be. Um, I don't want to... Uh, for years, I've been defending Palestinians. I've been saying I believe they should have a state of their own. I've been believed in a two-state solution. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't like people in that part of the world, Palestinians, to think that I, as a Jew, am not on their side and I'm not for them. I'm not, I'm not on their side when it comes to somebody like Hamas doing what they did, but I am for them having their own state and their, you know, and, and recognition by the world of the state of, of Palestine. So, anyway, I just don't like the fact that they equate they they're equating Jews, all Jews. Me, is there any other Jews here tonight? No. Yeah. Oh yeah, Alan. Yeah. Alan. yeah. yeah. Doesn't seem like he is, Jeff. but he is. Jeff. Jeff. <laughs> Jeff. And, and, and Jeff. And Jeff. That we and should Trump. be considered the same as Israelis. We aren't. You know, and so I, you know, it's it's just. Uh, but you're the only you're the only Jew out of the three of us that hasn't been to Israel. And you, I'm the only Jew out of the three of you who never will go to Israel. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you know, especially to a music festival. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I mean, what Hamas did was terrible. This is absolutely yeah, unconscionable. Yeah. But what Israel did in, repro- in, re- in, re- in, re- in respect to that and in trying to get even was overkill. And that's sad. It's a whole sad, horrible situation. Yeah. And uh, it, it bothers me. So before we leave, I think that we should probably play a game we play every now and then. It's the first international game we have ever played on this program, and it is, what is Brie eating (laughs) in Indonesia? Mm -hmm. You already know. Sushi. Yeah, you know, when I'm here, I eat that. Let me see if I can get a picture. I always come here. This place is great. This is his favorite restaurant. Oh, I see. Okay. Now, do they have, do they, when you order there, if I said to them, would you give me a California roll, do they know what that is? Whoops, we lost uh, Bree. <laughs> he's breaking up. Oh, he's nodding, yes. Yeah, Maybe he's you, asking. Bree, did you hear my question? He shouldn't move his camera at all. He lost his signal for a while or something. Huh? Yeah, yeah. No audio. Well, anyway, I don't think he delivers uh, <laughs> in New York or Connecticut. <laughs> See, he's, he's, no, he's in bad shape. We only have about a minute left here. But uh, mm. anyway, so uh, what a world, what a world. You know, I, if I were to go, if you were to go anywhere in the world, where could you go right now where there isn't something wrong happening? Mm-hmm. Right. They're, they're having their problems in England with the, with the prime minister having to call for a new election for a vote of confidence, which he's not going to get. Uh, you know, I guess you could go to like Italy or Spain. Yeah, Spain Italy is just Carlos. going to Austria. I it's hear nice things about Portugal, time. you know, but uh, let's not go to any places at war with somebody else. Well, let me start the theme song because it doesn't matter when I start it, actually. Uh, there it is. You, you can't hear it, but I can hear it here. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Appreciate it. And yeah, I'm glad I appreciate, I uh, Charlene, so sorry to hear about your mother, uh, but... Uh, you Thank know, you, Alex. The fact that you feel this bad is how good a mother she was, you know? And mm-hmm. uh, I just, my respects to you. Uh, thank Alan, you, Alex. Alan, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Josh, always good to have you here anytime we can. Charlie, once again, love your feistiness. Brian, thank you so much, and thanks so much for a Quick appearance by that lovely daughter of yours. Is she waiting to come back in? Oh, okay. <laughs> and Missy. finally, Jeffy. let's say goodbye to uh, uh, to uh, Tony. Everybody, good night, Tony. Uh, everybody, give a big wave goodbye, and I'll give a big wave goodbye at you. Okay. That's our citizen panel for tonight. Uh, we'll have another one on Monday uh, when we do the pop-up show, which will be here at four o'clock on. Uh, Facebook. Uh, otherwise, we'll see you again next, uh, let's see, Wednesday. Same time, same station in life. In the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her, okay? Good night, everybody. Have a nice weekend. Nice Memorial Day weekend.